Good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church's online virtual service. We're so happy that you're here with us. We're so honored and blessed to be able to bring these videos to you. Wherever you are, near or far, you are part of the Grace family. We pray that things in your life are going very well. And if you came in need of something today, just trust that God knows that. So join with us as we worship, sing loud, and just trust that in the word, God will speak to you. Thank you so much for participating and supporting these videos. We're so happy that you're here. Welcome. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, I have no idea what it was like for Jesus to walk this earth, what he had to deal with. But what I appreciate is that he promised that the Holy Spirit, that the Comforter, would be what was left behind to help us. Father, every day we're going to fail, and you know that. You never stop forgiving us. The heart of love that you have. Sometimes I feel like, Father, when I come before you and I ask for forgiveness again, I know I feel like this time you're going to say no. Because how many times have I asked? And Father, that's just not how you work. I pray that your children would take comfort in this. First of all, that we're not alone, that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, just even in the name Comforter, we will receive the comfort that we need just to get through the next moment of whatever is going on in our life. And second of all, that that forgiveness will never run out. That is a well that will never run dry. Thank you so much, Father, for your promises and for your love and what Jesus' life and death meant for us and means for us now every day that we walk in this world. In his name we pray. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still in the love, love, love Your good, good father Let's pray for today's offering. I want to thank you once again for your wonderful support. And I want to ask that God would bless you and continue to help us as we attempt to get the message of the gospel out to as many as God would allow us to. Thank you, Lord, for your people who you have called, whom you have called into your church. We pray that you would fill them with the knowledge and the understanding of the word of God so that they may have an effective ministry as a royal priesthood here on earth and into eternity. We pray that you would find us faithful in all that we do. Thank you for the forgiveness that makes us makes it possible for us to continue in this ministry. And thank you, Lord, for your great love manifested to us through Jesus Christ the Lord who died for our sins upon the cross. Amen. Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise. Well. Be
Good morning and welcome back. Welcome back to the final installment of the Church of the Living God. I could probably preach two or three more sermons on the church, but I decided I had to cut it off somewhere. And um, I'm going to use the epistle of First Peter to kind of wrap everything up since the whole discussion in the New Testament began with Peter and the apostles and Jesus when he told Peter after that great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock I will build my church, which is that statement that I've been trying to build on in this series about how the Lord's church is his church, and he's the one that's building and sustaining it, and he's the one that is um, coming back for it. It doesn't belong to any man, any denomination, any culture group, any nation group, any people group. It is a conglomeration of all of the people that God calls through time and from different cultures and languages into a relationship with himself. And uh, with that called out ecclesia group, he builds a church, which at the end of time we will all see because we will be in it um, with the Lord's grace. I hope that you will be in it and you'll be able to see the church in all of its glory at the end of time when finally all of the divisions and all of the the fallouts and all of the misunderstandings of one another will be dealt with and will be in 100% communion and unity with the Lord and each other. So let's pray as we wrap this one up. Thank you, Lord, for this scriptural journey that we've taken about what the church is. The church is yours. Man can claim um, sovereignty over it, uh, but it is not his to claim. You are the head of the church. You are the pope. You are the prophet, the priest, the king. You are the shepherd who laid down your life for your sheep. The only way into your church is through you. Any other way is a false way. So, Lord, find us to be faithful in our time to stay within your fold, listening to the voice of the great shepherd and uh, being instructed and guided by you and your word through the Spirit which you have given to us without measure. We ask in Jesus' name that you'll help us to distill all that has been learned about this and to try to understand how we fit into it as well. Um, keep us, Lord, from cynicism and doubt and uh, judgment. Help us, Lord, to understand that we follow you. We don't follow anyone man-made organization or any man or woman for that matter we follow the lord jesus christ the founder sustainer and the owner of his church in jesus name amen so take out your sermon notes and follow along as we uh, go to this passage in peter the foundation stone of the church is elected by god we know that that foundation stone is jesus himself he is the stone on which the apostles are laid, and then the rest of the church rises up as an edifice, if you will, metaphorically. So this stone, this foundation for this new creation called the church is Jesus himself. He is elected by God. God chose him, uh, but man did not. Man would not. Man rejected him. Man kind, including God's own people, the Jewish people, rejected him as the, as the chosen stone, as the chosen one of God. I am making an emphasis of this because Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. In his discussion with believers in his epistle, he says, as you, if you're born again and if you have accepted him as Savior and Lord, as you come to him, it's a continuous stance. It's not a you came to him once and you don't need to come anymore. As you come and keep coming, it's a relationship that begins and keeps on going until its culmination when we finally, one, culmination when we finally meet him. As you come to him, the living stone. There's a lot of scripture passages about this that it didn't include. Uh, one is in uh, Zechariah, which is really neat about a stone with eyes on it. Uh, the living stone is Jesus Christ. He's rejected by men. So he's not elected by man. Man doesn't like him. Man doesn't want him over them. He's rejected by man, all men. Uh, the world and its systems and its governance 
has no inclination to accept Christendom or any of its tenets and teachings as a guide for the way they run things. But he is chosen by God, it says here, and precious to him. So God chose Jesus as the living stone. Man does not. Remember that because it'll help you to not get frustrated with the way the world is because it's just a, a statement of fact about the way things are. If you're a Christian and you believe in the Lord and he's the foundation stone and you see the way things are even in Christendom itself and it doesn't look like the way it's supposed to be, don't be alarmed. The Lord anticipated that a long time ago. The, uh, the Lord himself said to the disciples, the world has hated me, so the world will hate you. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated me first. So the, this teaching is... I think, given to the church because we need to keep things in perspective. The temporal world and the world system, whatever time we live in, whether it's a thousand years ago, now, or even a thousand years into the future, if that's how long the world lasts, um, it's temporal. It's all temporal. It's not going to last. The Lord wants us, his people, to focus on the eternal nature of the uh, kingdom of God. Jesus, before Pilate, said to Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, my disciples would fight for me. But my kingdom is not of this world. So as a believer, always remember that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be involved in, to whatever degree we can be involved in uh, temporal affairs in our in our lifetimes. We should try to do what we can to help the world around us, but ultimately uh, we are in a kingdom that is not of this world, and we are going to be in that kingdom forever, and that's what we're actually uh, being instructed to look at in the scripture. So that way I think it'll help you, and it has helped me to refocus my attentions and my energy on the eternal things because the temporal things are frustrating and they don't always turn out the way we want them. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about the way things are even in uh, man-made structures all around us, even the church. We have to always remember, okay, the Lord will straighten all of this out one day. He'll make everything right in the end. And all I need to do is serve him. And no matter what comes, stay faithful. Look what it says here about the stone in Psalms. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118 is a psalm of ascents. It is a psalm that was sung by the Jewish people as they approached Jerusalem and as they were singing and chanting the words of God, uh, the psalms, as they went to Jerusalem for a religious festival. So this is... In the middle of this one psalm is this statement that the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this. Now, we'll try to, I'll try to um, detail this out for you as we go forward. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus looked directly at them, them being uh, some of his detractors, and he asked, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. This was a confrontation between Jesus and those who decided that he was not the chosen one of the Lord. And Jesus is instructing them in the word that the Psalms actually say that man, the builders, the leaders of the people of Israel have rejected who he is, but God has chosen him. And he is the capstone. And then he goes on to say that this stone, this living stone, the capstone, when a man or a woman comes to him, they are broken to pieces. That is, they are humbled. They are come to face to face with their sin and they repent and they ask the Lord for forgiveness. But if you reject him as the chosen one, the stone will crush you. And that's ominous and actually says in the rest of this passage that they looked for a way to arrest him because they didn't like what he was saying because he they knew he was talking about them, that they were rejecting him and that they were in danger of divine judgment. Uh, that's all in the past now. It literally has now happened to the very people he was talking to. Once they lived their lives out physically and died, they found out 
personally, each and every individual, that Jesus Christ really is the one that God chose to be the capstone, and that in our lives here on earth, we have the opportunity to decide he is the one that God chose or he isn't. It's up to you. In Acts 4, verse 5 through 12, <clears throat> there's an interesting, uh, another kind of a spinoff on this same passage. This is uh, Peter and the apostles being brought into uh, question by the leadership, the Sanhedrin of the Jewish people, because they had done a miracle, and uh, they're trying to find out what went on. So watch. The rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. So like, that's like the whole government. Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest's family. So these are the the who's who in leadership at the time of the apostles and Jesus, uh, the, the, the movers and the shakers, the influencers, the ones that pulled the strings, so they thought. They had Peter and John, the two apostles, brought before them and began to question them by what power or by or what name did you do this that it heal a a lame man now peter filled with the holy spirit said to them rulers and elders of the people if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed then know this you are all the people of israel you and all the people of israel it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the, the stone, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So you see that they recognized, they understood the apostles who Jesus is. They teach it. It's the foundational truth of what they put forth even to the leadership of their own nation. And that is what the church is founded upon. Jesus Christ is the capstone. Jesus Christ is the foundation stone. God elected this. God chose this. So when I say that the church is no man's church, it is God's church and he is building it upon the one man that everyone rejected, I think is significant. And I think that, that uh, we as Christians need to understand it because you are identifying with someone who the world will never accept as the solution. The world will never look at as the one that they need to look towards for um, guidance and for instruction um, and admonition. They'll never look at Jesus and Jesus' teaching as that um, for them. They'll always reject. They'll always conspire against us. It says in Psalms 2, why did the nations conspire and the peoples against the Lord and his anointed? So this is all over the scriptures and it's just as a reminder to believers here in 1 Peter, as you come to him, the stone that was rejected, Remember that since you're identifying with a rejected with a rejected Messiah, uh, you you're going to also suffer the same kind of persecution. People aren't going to give you Nobel Peace Prizes. People aren't going to recognize you. Oh, yay! You're following Jesus. How wonderful! Let's put it on the news tonight. Nobody is going to give you that kind of recognition in this world. But that's not what you're living for. Hopefully, in Isaiah 28, another passage that kind of highlights this. Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, I, God, am laying in Zion, that's another word for Jerusalem, Israel, a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. That's why Peter said he is elected of God and precious to him. Precious cornerstone of sure foundation. Whoever believes or trust in, relies on, and adheres to that stone, I'm using the amplified version here, will not, will never be ashamed or give way or hasten away in sudden panic, i.e. That's the amplified version of that verse. Meaning, when you do come to him and you put trust in him, the world will not recognize it as legitimate, but that doesn't matter you're going to be on a foundation that is sure, it is tested, it is immovable, unshakable, and your eternal soul is at rest. 
It's really cool teaching, okay? So remember that. We're founded on Jesus Christ. He is the foundation stone of the church. He is the capstone of the church as well. So everything that is the church is Jesus Christ. In Zechariah 3, 9, Behold, upon the stone which I have set before Joshua. Oh, I did include it. Upon that one stone are seven eyes, or seven facets. Behold, I, God, will carve upon it its inscription. On the stone itself, there'll be an inscription, says the Lord of hosts. And here's the inscription that's on the stone. I, God, will remove the iniquity and guilt, that's the sin, of the land in a single day. Well, scripturally, we know that God did this when Jesus died on the cross. The sin of the world, it says in 1 John, he died for our sins <clears throat> and the sins of the whole world. What Jesus did on the cross in one day took care of all of the sin of all of humanity in a single day. So it's really cool to understand that the stone that the church is built upon is Jesus Christ. And when we trust in him, we won't have a problem. No matter what happens, we'll never be shaken. We're solid with him because he's solid. Now, like him, living stones, like him, he's a living stone, and we are now called living stones. We are also being built into an eternal dwelling place, um, tabernacle or temple are some of the English variations of the translation here, with an eternal service unto God. So you and I, as Peter is inferring, are coming to the living stone as living stones like him, and we're being built into an eternal dwelling. So watch, as we continue in First Peter, you also, us also, well, in context, us also like Christ. He's rejected of men, chosen by God. We're rejected of men, chosen by God, elected by God to believe in him. We're also living stones like him. You also like living stones, like the living stone Jesus, are being built into a spiritual house. That word is tabernacle. Uh, akin, uh, referring back to when the Israelites saw the glory of God tabernacled in the tabernacle itself, a tent structure, which was kind of metaphorical for the coming of Jesus in his body, that God dwelt in this temporal structure. We're being built into this structure, a temple, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when I say that, we are being built into an eternal dwelling place with an eternal service unto God. Our purpose in the church is an eternal one. We have an eternal purpose now. God wants to use us and will use us as part of his new creation, this dwelling place which he himself dwells in because every Christian is born again, thereby every Christian that's truly born again, the Holy Spirit indwells every Christian and in eternity, every Christian will have the Spirit of God in them, God will live in them, God will be with them, and they will see him face to face. He will be their God. This is all in the book of Revelation. It's all part and parcel of the same teaching. We're being built. So the church isn't a structure built by people. There's the church over there. There's the beautiful cathedral over there. It might be a building that they're pointing at, but it's not a church. You can build beautiful buildings, but the church are people. The church is people who have been redeemed by God, who are a holy priesthood, all of them. Uh, this is in, in Protestant theology. Martin Luther identified this priesthood of all believers from these passages. The priesthood of all believers was a difficult concept for people to adopt because People were used to looking at a guy that was dressed different, lived different, was separate from them. He's a priest, not me. But the New Testament teaches that if you're a born-again believer, man or woman or child, you are a priest. And a priest is one who takes the blessings of God and gives them out to the people and takes the, the problems that people have and brings them to God so that God may resolve them. That's what priesthood is. You serve as an intermediary between God and people. You are a priest if you are born again. It's not just Jimmy Sandoval, the pastor, the preacher, that's the, the priest. It's all believers are a priesthood. We all have an equal standing before God. It doesn't mean we, have, we all have equal gifting. 
We don't, but we have equal standing. As a believer, you have authority to pray for others, to evangelize others, to encourage others to walk with the Lord. You have a priesthood as one of the believers in God's church. Our faith and our service to the Lord in his church is guaranteed to be rewarded and vindicated. There are guarantees in the scriptures about what you're doing for the Lord. You may not receive from man or even the structures of man the recognition and the accolades that perhaps you might think you should have. You shouldn't live for that. Jesus actually talks about this in great detail. Do not do your righteous acts to be seen of men. Uh, live before God. Let God be the one who sees what you're doing and let God be the one who rewards you because the scriptures are clear about this. Reward is coming. Look at 1 Peter 2, 6 through 7. He continues, for the scriptures, in the scriptures it says, look, I, God, lay, in, uh, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will not be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, just like it's precious to God, it's now precious to you because Jesus Christ, you recognize him as Lord and Savior and your devotion and your relationship and your um, loyalty to him is now, now the, should be the focus and the center of your life. So you don't have to wonder about, is this worth it? Am I really going to get anything out of this? What has happened is because he has drawn you to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have come to that place where you are confessing with the apostles, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, you now are being given the, in, if you will, the initial blessings of uh, acceptance into God's family, into God's people, into God's temple, into God's church. So watch. In Matthew 5, 11 through 12, Jesus talks a little, about, a little bit about this. When people who are following him are persecuted, he says this, You are blessed when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So you chose to identify with Jesus. You chose to identify as Christian. And you find that, like I said, the world doesn't give any recognition to that. Indeed, they seem to be uniformly against the idea. They don't want radicalism in faith to Jesus in their circle. So if you're a family a member and you've turned to the Lord, all of a sudden, everybody in the family is kind of, oh, no, we don't want a, a radical, you know, hallelujah kind of a person in our midst. And you find yourself being more and more ostracized. He's saying that you're blessed when this happens. Rejoice and be glad because great is a reward in heaven. So there's the, the phrase, your reward. There is a reward, and look where it is. It's in heaven. Don't strive for the reward here on earth. The reward here on earth is not enough. It's nothing to be compared to the reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He goes into detail about this, about people who do their religious activities to be seen of other people and to receive recognition and accolades. He says they get the reward that they're going to get. That's it. That's all they're going to get. But you and I, if we're serving the Lord, we're serving him and knowing that in the end of time, when we finally are in his presence, there will be reward. The Son of Man, Matthew 16 and 27, is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then when he returns, He's going to rapture the church, yes, but here's what's going to happen. The church is going to be taken by him to himself, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. So reward is coming, or if you will, even you can infer lack of reward based on what you've done for the Lord while you're here on earth. So do everything that you can for the Lord while you're here on earth. Love people, love sinners, forgive, be an agent of the of the gospel of the Lord God to people who don't love him. Pray, go the extra mile, turn the other cheek. Always don't get cynical and start cursing the darkness and the people in darkness. Always strive to work with them, for them, advocate for them, pray for them, that hopefully the Lord will touch them and bring them into what you already have, okay? Those who re reject the stone 
that God accepted will find it to be their greatest obstacle. Many people say no to Jesus, many. Many people have been given, I would say, I would venture to say that all people are drawn to Jesus. He said this when he was um, in the Gospel of John right before the Last Supper and the Greeks were coming to talk to him and they talked to Philip who talked to Andrew and then Jesus goes off and makes this statement. Uh, it is now time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Uh, the Father will lift him up and all men will be drawn. So all men, I think, um, I can't verify this, it's just a, an opinion, but I think that the Lord draws all men, all mankind, towards what Jesus did on the cross. And there is where um, the division happens. Either you accept what he did for you on the cross, or you say, nah, I don't need that, I don't want that. And those who reject what Jesus did on the cross find that rejection to be the greatest obstacle. Uh, because that's where real eternal life begins. If you want life, real life, people talk about, you know, having abundance and happiness and peace. And when I was growing up in the hippie age, peace, peace, everybody was looking for it. And so they started using hallucinogenic drugs and free love and all of this stuff. And they didn't find peace. You don't find they rejected Christianity. Let's try this religion. Let's try that one. There's no peace in all of that. It really is at Jesus Christ's cross where you find the real purpose for life and eternal life. So if you reject what Jesus did on the cross, you'll actually, Jesus did on the cross, you'll actually find that what you, that rejection does is it becomes a giant stumbling block. And if you've ever walked and stumbled in so, on something like at night or you're hiking and you just hit a root or a rock and you stumble, it's just a, it's kind of a difficult thing. Sometimes people fall down and break bones and stuff. So, don't let Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross become an obstacle, because look what Peter says here. To those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, a stone that causes men slash women to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message What's the message? The message is, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. If you believe in what he did for you, you will be saved, you will be pardoned, you'll have eternal life, you'll have abundant life, you have promises that are eternal. They've rejected this, they disobey, they don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear this, I don't like that, I want a different solution. So, and then he says, it is what they are destined for. To disobey and reject Jesus Christ proves something. It proves the person is um, God-hating, irredeemable, uncaring, um, guilty of the uh, unpardonable sin, guilty of it because of the rejection. They stumble over Jesus Christ because they reject the message. Now. A lot more could be said about that. Of course, the scriptures do say that the Lord wants all men to be saved. It is God's desire that instead of fighting with what he has done for you, that you would simply look at it and say, okay, God, you're God. I think you're smarter than me. I think you're bigger than me. I think I'll listen to what you say. If you say I'm a sinner and I need what Jesus did for me on the cross, I'll accept that. Instead of this constant, oh, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do everything my way. Um, and at the end of time, find that that was a great and the greatest of all disappointments. So let's read this together. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the only one you are to dread. He will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. This issue of the rejection of Christ is serious and much more serious than many understand because the way of the world is, oh, I think every way leads to God and God has to accept any way that anyone chooses. But this, the scriptures are adamant about this. We already read, there is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. Look what it says here in Thessalonians concerning the teaching of the end of time. The coming of the lawless one, this is the antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed by all kinds of counterfeit signs and wonders and miracles, 
of every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Now watch what it says. They perish because they refused to love the truth and be saved. So to refuse what Jesus did on the cross causes the cross to become a stumbling block in front of you, an obstacle to refuse what God has provided for you as the pardon for your sin is to say to God, you're not right. I'm going to do it my way. I think you're wrong. And if you think you have the ability to correct God, then there's no remedy for that because you will find out at the end of your earthly existence, which is only temporal, whoever you are, rich or poor, influential or not, educated or uneducated, you stand in front of the Almighty God one day and you proclaim to that God that there is other ways and there's a different way and you need to take me. Um, he doesn't have an obligation to honor that. Uh, to refuse the love that God has shown, God so loved the world, he's demonstrated love, he's shown it through Jesus' death on the cross, and if people say, nope, nope, don't want that, don't need that, that's old-fashioned, that's old hat, we're past that, then there's no hope for that. I don't know what to say other than I hope that God changes your mind so that you look once again at what Jesus did on the cross for you and stop fighting against God. Now, those who accept the living stone are granted all of the rights and privileges of all of God's people. When you do say, okay, God, your way is right. I'm going to listen. I'm going to accept this. You're going to find that God has granted unto you something better than American citizenship. It is all of the rights and all of the privileges granted to all of the people of God. Let's look at this in Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen people, he says, but you, in contrast to those who reject, you who don't reject, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. I underlined all of those phrases, chosen, royal, holy people. And these are given to you when you receive and accept what God did for you on the cross. And why? So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness of atheism, agnosticism, disbelief, false religion, man-made religion, into his, God's, wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, to cap this off, let's read Hebrews 12 together, and uh, you can read it out loud, and or just read it, read it together with me silently if you wish. And um, this is a declaration of what you have come to, what God has granted to you as one who has become part of his church. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. An assembly is the gathering of all of the family of God, angels and humans, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, Moses, David, um, Adam, Noah, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So let's continue reading. This is Revelation now. And they sang a new song, the elders around the throne. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men slash women slash children for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So the church is made up of people from all over the world, from all kinds of ethnicities and cultures, and you have made them, says the scriptures in Revelation, you, Jesus, have made them, these people from all of these ethnicities and languages and tribes, to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Isn't that cool? You're part of a something that is eternal. 
It's not from this world. My kingdom is not of this world. You're part of something that when you are finally in it in the end of time, you'll just be like, wow, why did I ever stress about Republicans and Democrats and Trump and Biden and Putin and Russia and Ukraine and global warming and global freezing and all the things that the world keeps on demanding that we give our attention to. Give your attention to the eternal kingdom that God has brought you into. One day he'll call us all home and we'll be with him forever. Isn't that a great thought? And it's not a fantasy and a whistling in the dark. It is a promise of the God who said, I will build my church. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the teaching of what the church is. So much more in the scripture. This is only the scratching of the surface because we're going to live it out forever. We're going to find out personally if we are born again, if we have accepted what you did on the cross. Each one of us will experience firsthand and personally Jesus Christ, all of the redeemed, all of the elect angels, and God himself upon his throne face to face. That is our destiny. That is the kingdom that we are in. This is the church of the living God. Amen.
Thank you so much for being a part of this Sunday's virtual service at Grace Community Church. You are our family. We pray that your week is very blessed. We hope you like this video and that you share it with your friends and family. Click like, subscribe, and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you.